Hey, what's going on, guys? It's me, Train Man, and welcome back to uh, Horse Voice, <coughs> Horse Voice Zombie Train Stories. And um, well, today let me go over real quick what we did in the episode first. Uh, we started out with Power Island. We did more trees around the area, and we got most of the ground cover done. Although there are a couple of places I'm still deliberating on, and uh, well, actually, we got about two thirds of the ground cover done. Is, is a good measurement. And then I go up and do a lot of terrain work around Albany again, because I feel like that area is going to need its finishing touches. I was tempted to move on to... I was tempted to move on to the old main, because that's going to be need to be done by next season. You guys haven't seen the... Uh, you guys have not yet seen the uh, episode listing if we put that out, but uh, you guys... You know. You'll know. Anyways... Anyways, where were we last time? We had just left Scranton. We were talking about uh, the zombie train's origin. And that's the kind of thing where, you know, I, I, would, I should have listened to the last episode to know where we were, but I can hop on right about where we went through Scranton, and I'll talk about the news team that we encountered, uh, who, you know... We ended up meeting at least one unit of it repeatedly later. Um, as well as Emilio's point of view uh, down in Quonset Point until we arrived. Uh, it started to snow. I recall the snow turned to blizzard, and we were still moving. There was nothing else on the rails to get in our way. And we traveled north to Binghamton, and then over and approximately a uh, roughly northeast uh, until we reached Albany and Selkirk. From there we crossed the Hudson River, uh, traveled eastward onto the Providence and Worcester in Worcester, Mass, which, you know, was a, was a return to Worcester. They were happy to see us. They were kind of impressed by how far we'd come. And they let us back in, and they worked with us, and we traded supplies, and they were whom we made our first uh, contract and deal with. Uh, we took on a handful of other people that wanted to get to New Haven, if I recall correctly. I think that was I think that was it because that was where we went straight after Quonset. Uh, we kind of had to keep moving back in those days. So, I mean, we still did keep moving. There was never a reason to stop. But you know, at, at this point in time, there was no place to stop. Quonset Point was a stopgap, it was a gathering point, which is why when we left Worcester, which was a problem in and of itself, because the way the walls were built and the way the track work is made things very difficult to rearrange the train and to get us out of there. So Worcester we managed to get out of uh, shortly thereafter, and we were heading down, uh, we headed down, we met with the Northeast Corridor, and the, from there we traveled down to Quonset. Now, something I've failed to mention is throwing switches. For the most part on these railroads was uh, usually controlled by a tower by a dispatcher. And, you know, in a lot of cases we didn't need to stop and we could rest on the main line. So throwing ourselves into, uh, throwing ourselves into an adjacent spur track was not a problem. And, it, you know... It wasn't a problem because we ne it never arose. It wasn't something that we needed to do. However, uh, other switches, we had to forcibly sever the uh, motors. Uh, either we were breaking locks or breaking motors, depending, because if it was just a manual throw, like a lot of the stuff on the P&W, uh, we could take care of that with just some bolt cutters, chop the lock off, and uh, use that switch stand from that point onward. We just had to be careful of it. You know, we, we had a lot of... We covered a lot of ground. Uh, of course, the signals were mostly dead, uh, but we had to get used to a lot of different switch stand indicators, uh, and then we had to be very keen on noticing the actual switch points when it came down to areas with motors, especially uh, uh, on part of CSX's division, like through uh, the Boston and Albany section. And it was it was a fairly heavy percentage of those that were switch motors. So what we'd have to do is we'd either we'd either open them up and throw them manually, or we'd uh, forcibly disconnect. And by disconnect, I mean cut 
the motors away from the switches, and this was a procedure and a half. Uh, we eventually started picking up switch stands, like picking up manual switch stands from places where they were not needed or discarded, uh, and using these in place of them, you know, we'd pull up the, we'd pull up the switch motors lock, stock, and barrel. So, we'd place the, uh, you know, we'd, we'd replace the, uh, switch stand, we'd spike it down, and that would be that, you know? It was a, you know, it's, it's a lot harder than it sounds, to be honest. I was just thankful I wasn't the one doing it most of the time. We had, you know, quite a few people on the train from the beginning, and, you know, people didn't have really defined jobs until we got our cars up and running, which is something I can talk about a little bit later. So it was just like, okay, who can run out and do this? Who can run out and do this? And, you know, Emilio and I are going to watch the engine. Emilio ended up being my fireman uh, once we picked him up. But for the time being, it was John and uh, Ian who were in the cabin. John ended up get, getting moved back out of the cabin. This was... You know, the kind of thing where I, I didn't expect to see John doing what he did in the end. You know, he wanted to, he wanted to be big and important. He's John. Uh, but at the same time, it was like, well, we need someone to do this. And it was, you know, this in particular is not a glamorous job. It is not a fun job. And it's probably the most exposed, the most work-heavy, like physical labor-heavy thing. And that is while in transit taking bucketfuls and shovelfuls of coal out of the hoppers and putting them into the coal bucket in the engine. Or, you know, in the tender. Sorry. Uh, 3254 from the beginning had an automatic stoker, so fireman's job wasn't hugely difficult or physically intensive. But uh, this job was. And, you know, it wasn't enough so that we could r keep running continuously most of the time, uh, unless he wanted to work continuously, which I didn't expect him to do, but he 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 ended up nailing a system down where, you know, we could run a lot longer than one tender's worth of coal in one sitting, and then you know once we stopped, we'd get more people in the back putting coal in so we could refill quicker, and then we'd discard the empty hopper and pick up a full one. Um, every hopper we picked up. Uh, every time we emptied a hopper, we made it a point to, you know, notate it, you know, put a ZT symbol on it, uh, and this didn't become standardized until a long, long time in, but I'm so off track right now. You know, we ended up building, like, ladder rungs into the insides of hoppers, uh, well, ones that didn't have them already, a handful of them did, I was kind of surprised. Presumably, I guess it was in case you fell into the hopper which would have been unfortunate. Uh, but, like, ladder rungs or stairs to climb up out of the bottom of a hopper or a gondola. Anyways. Anyways. The freaking... What was I going to say? Okay, yo, so. So. Coming back from Scranton. Coming back from Scranton, what happened was... We ran through the snowstorm, we hit the, uh, we made it outside of Binghamton, we were going northeast. We made it through Selkirk, we made it through, I'm honestly trying to remember where we ran into this news crew, and I can't for the life of me remember the actual name of the news crew, but it was friggin', um, the, the name of the woman that, that stuck with me was Diana Lavoie. And I ended up running into her repeatedly. And we really hit it off, needless to say. Uh, however, you know. Uh, unfortunately for me, nothing ever came of it. Uh, anyways. She was stunning. Uh, she was stunning, she was smart, she ended up working for Noah... Uh, well, whatever was left of them, because the news team obviously didn't have much use. There wasn't anybody watching TV. Anyways. We ran into them. They were running alongside us, and we didn't notice them. They were driving alongside the railroad tracks in one of those little towns. I think it was Westchester. Um, 
Massachusetts. And broadcasting this, and Emilio could see the broadcast, and that was how they knew we were coming. And that's how they knew where we were. And then we stopped outside of Springfield. Uh, we stopped west of Springfield, sort of collected ourselves to get through the city, because we knew it was going to be hell. Then we went through Springfield. On the other side, we encountered a van that was getting swarmed, you know. I'm not sure if they had broken down or if they were out of gas or something like that, but it's not like uh, it's not like gasoline was particularly difficult to find, but it wasn't usually easy to find because a lot of time, a lot of the time, people would drain uh, gas stations pretty quickly. You know, you don't think about how often a gas station needs refilling until they're not getting refilling. And so these guys were stopped in like a parking lot that was adjacent to the railroad tracks, and you know, you could tell the zombies were coming up on them, and we kind of had this trail of zombies in our way, because the train is loud. You're just able to, to outrun them. Um, and if you hit any, it's not going to stop you, that's for damn sure. Especially with the uh, the plow. We got a we got a plow that was originally mounted to the jeep given to us by, by Worcester, and we moved it over to the engine, thanks to the guys in Worcester. So the engine had this spiked you know, hardened steel plow that went through about anything you told it to. And I was never unimpressed by this thing. But anyways, you know, it tore down a couple buildings once, but that was, that's much later. So, Walls of Worcester swapped the plow, picked up three people who wanted to go to New Haven. Um... At this point, we already had the news crew, and they departed, so we traded three for three. Um, we traveled southward into Rhode Island, and we stopped at Quonset, and we picked up one, two, three, four, five people. Five people? No, 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 Ian wasn't with us on the ride, so it was just John in the cab, so we weren't going very much. Okay, so, and then we picked up three more, so we picked up eight people, is that what I said? Um, in Quonset, and from there we sort of bailed on Quonset and went to New Haven. New Haven was not as fortified as, um, not as fortified as Worcester, but they seemed to be better defended and more defensible. I don't, I don't know what struck me as that, but, uh, they're sort of, Worcester was having an inherent problem with Boston, <coughs> which I think was eventually their undoing. But the uh, but New Haven was really acting as a decent haven. I'm not sure if they changed their name, but people just started calling them Haven, and they remained that way for a long time. I'm not sure if they ever stopped being a holdout for survivors, but I know their population dwindled after Yonkers. And that's something I need to explain. I'll do that next episode. I'll, although I need, to, I'll need to speed through some stuff, and I can never remember if Toronto or Yonkers came first. It must have been Yonkers. It must have been Yonkers because Toronto was us getting away from the coast. Uh, you know, anyways. Toronto was us going, you know... We're, we're sort of downtrodden, but we can still do stuff. Anyways, and also, did we go... Eh, that's something to remember next time. Something to figure out next time. So, New Haven, we stopped. Uh, thanks to the news broadcast, people sort of knew our name, which was really nice. Um, we stopped, and we did a lot of modifications to the train there. We took on a lot of supplies, and we got our first... Uh, you know, not our first passengers, but we got our first contract, and... That was to run up to Springfield a couple more times and do some scouting and run even farther north to what to White River Junction once and uh, pick up some people who were radioing from there. And that's, you know, that was our first forays into the north. And that was the first time we ever encountered a uh, an actual limitation of the engine because up till that point it was all, you know, it all worked fairly well. The, you know, we had we had coal, we had steam, we had power. Uh, and even though going through the Boston and Albany was uh, occasionally slow going, you know, down to 10 miles an hour sometimes, especially in the weather, it wasn't, uh, we never 
had to uh, lose any part of the train or anything like that, and that happened up at up in uh, New Hampshire. So, anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and remember to ask any questions you like, and I'll respond to them as soon as possible, whether in the comments or in a video if it's long enough. And um, with that, uh, next week we'll talk about whatever I mentioned. I guess Yonkers. So, uh, uh, train men out. Thank you.